right. Hello and welcome to Bioconductor 2021. This is the epigenomics gene regulation session, and we're going to start the talk soon, but first a few housekeeping items. If you have questions for the speakers, uh, please enter them into the Q&A tab and make sure that you list the speaker name first, just so that we're aware of who it's for, because we have a few speakers this time. Um, you also have the ability to upvote questions for the speaker to answer. And if you would like to ask your question live, you can use the raise hand feature and a moderator will bring you onto the stage so you can ask. There are a variety of emoticons available as well to give feedback to the speaker. And if for some reason you have to leave early, a video of the session will be available a couple of hours after the session has completed. The questions will be answered at the end, but please feel free to post them immediately into the Q&A tab. And, um, Please be sure to mention the speaker name again in the beginning of the question so that we know who it's for. And if you have more questions than what we're able to answer today due to the limited time, uh, feel free to reach out to one of the speakers uh, through the messaging feature of Intermediate Care. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ashan Su of Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, who will be discussing visualizing nanopore methylation data using nanomethods. All right, take it away, Sean. thank you. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks to uh, the bug that the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Just want to make sure that my slides are visible. All right. So my name is Sean Su. I'm a PhD student at the Ritchie Lab at the Water Eliza Hall in Melbourne, Australia. And today I'll be speaking to you about visualizing nanopore methylation data using NanomethVis, which is a bug of the package that I developed. So just some quick background. Um, I'm mainly focusing on 5MC methylation, which uh, is a gene regulator. And the way that it works is that when we find methylation in promoter regions of a gene, uh, in general, that means there will be suppression of that gene. And likewise, when there's uh, no methylation in the promoter regions, um, that gene is allowed to be expressed freely. And this plays an important role in various uh, different important processes in um, in the genome. So in particular, I'm looking at genomic imprinting, which is the parent of origin specific expression, which means uh, when you inherit two copies of um, a gene from both your parents, only one of those copies is expressed. Um, so there are genes that are only ever expressed from the maternal copy and genes that are only ever expressed from the paternal copy, depending on the methylation patterns. It also plays a role in X inactivation, which is the complete silencing of one of the two X chromosomes um, as a dosage compensation mechanism. And um, it also plays a very important role in the silencing of repetitive elements, which make up a large amount of our DNA, uh, because these elements tend to be ancient viruses that we don't want to be expressed. And the technology that I'm using to study this is nanopore sequencing. So it's a relatively new technology that many of you may have heard of by now. So what it is, is um, a, uh, a single DNA strand is pulled through these nanopores. And as it goes through, this produces an electrical signal that can be then used to infer what bases as well as modifications exist on those bases, um, as long as you haven't done any PCR. So using this technology, we can get nice long beads uh, and we can get very high throughput genome wide and pretty good measurement of methylation levels across the genome. And so the software that I developed, uh, which is now a part of Barconductor, and there's some new features in this particular presentation that are only available at the developmental version for now. That's on my GitHub. And so in general, um, this is the pipeline that people use to analyze methylation. So you do base calling, which is conversion of the raw signal into bases using uh, Guppy, which is the ONT software. And then you go through some alignment, methylation calling. And ideally after that, you want to do DMR, so differentially methylated region detection and visualization. So where I put these red arrows uh, are places where I identify gaps, which I thought required some more software to solve. And those gaps uh, in the arrows basically mean that the output of one software doesn't feed nicely into the next. Um, and at the very end, there wasn't really uh, a good package for doing nanopore specific visualization for methylation software. And that's what NanomethVis uh, does. So 
In terms of the data processing, I provide uh, multiple functions to convert NIAP data to fit through all the softwares in a pipeline. So um, to begin with, I allow the importing of data from various methylation callers, which due to this being quite a novel and new area of research, um, everyone makes a different methylation caller and then produces different output. So NanomethVis tries to handle that for some of the more commonly used methylation callers, Nanopolish, F5C, and Megalodon. It standardizes that into a NanomethVis format, which is compressed and indexed um, and actually allows partial access using our samples without ever decompressing the file. So once it's all nicely imported into the standard format, I don't need to decompress it to read it for any of the downstream analysis that I want to do. And from there, um, I can create my visualizations and also export it into various formats that would be useful for doing differential methylation analysis uh, using different bioconductor softwares. And so some of the plots that I can make using my package. So um, just a brief description of the experiment that this data comes from. Um, it's from these uh, first generation crosses between two well-known um, mouse strains, and we've collected three female mice placenta. So you know, each of these samples have two X chromosomes and ha having well-characterized parent strains means we could haplotype them quite easily. Um, and then we put each of these samples on one promethine flow cell to get this data. And just doing MDS plot, um, which is analogous to a PCA plot, we can see um, that overall the samples separate quite nicely based on their methylation profile, um, based uh, by their haplotypes. And then using this data, we can also look into, um, so using the plot aggregate regions function, we can look at how genes and other features are methylated uh, in a broader, more general sense. So in terms of aggregating over auto autosomal genes, what we see is that the methylation tends to dip heavily near the transcription start site, which is where the promoter region tends to be. Um, so it's heavily demethylated in that region, and then it quickly picks back up as you move into the gene body. And as you move towards the transcription uh, termination site, it actually um, keeps climbing until it peaks at the transcription termination site, and then it slides back down to a background level. And the other thing that we looked at was the methylation profiles aggregated over these L1, these line one repeats. Um, and we take only the complete copies of these as annotated by the L1 base database. And what we see is that for L1 repeats, the methylation as you move into the region starts, starts to slowly climb and then it peaks, then it dips down and actually um, has quite a dip in the second half of these features. Uh, and it's then picks back up and returns to the background level. So we haven't looked uh, in depth into why that is for L1 repeats, but it's just quite an interesting pattern to have observed. Then using this plot, we further uh, look at the methylation patterns in x activation. So there's two data here. There's the mouse placenta that's on the left and the neural stem cells on the right. So on the left and on the left of the left, um, those two plots on the left show the transcription start and end sites of the autosomal chromosomes. So aggregated over the autosomes, um, what we see is that there's not really much difference between um, the two parental chromosomes. Um, so they're virtually identical because there's nothing going on there. Um, genes should be expressed from both chromosomes. And so we expect those to be identical. And then looking at the right side of the left set of plots, um, we see that on chromosome X, where we expect to see X-A activation. Um, so X-A is the active X and X-I is the inactive X. And so we see that near the transcription start side, the X-A, the active X is slightly, very slightly less methylated than the inactive X. And then near the transcription end sites, um, the active X is actually more methylated than the inactive. But then when we look at neural stem cells, what we see is that um, obviously in the autosomes, um, both chromosomes are identical, but on the chromosome X, we see that 
there's a much more significant difference in methylation patterns between the active and inactive, whereby the active, you can see, is very significantly less methylated, and, um, the, and the inactive is uh, much more methylated. And then actually near the transcription end site of those two, um, it's actually a less significant difference. But I think in the neural stem cell is really what we expect to see of a inactivated X chromosome. Um, we think that in the mouse placenta because that tissue is not expected to mature into a fully functional organism that the control mechanisms there might not, um, might not be the same as in proper mature cells. Then finally, um, we can zoom in to the gene, to kind of these small genomic regions where we look at PEG3, which is a parentally expressed gene, or the paternally expressed gene. And so we see on the expressed copy of um, this gene, on the paternal um, copy, there's demethylation, and on the silenced copy, there is uh, increased methylation in the transcription start site. And so there's another plot beneath that shows very much the same information, but using a heat map. Um, and the heat map also kind of shows gap in coverage in those areas in which there's not much difference in this particular plot. And then on the right, um, it's just very much the same thing, but this is a MEG3, the maternally expressed gene 3. And we see that for the maternally expressed gene, there is demethylation in the maternal copy and um, a maintained methylation in the paternal copy. And with that, I would like to thank all the members of the Ritchie Lab, um, so that's my lab, and all the members of Bullet Lab and Speed Lab. Um, so Speed Lab did much of the prior work on this. I'd like to thank the animal technicians and the people at Monash who helped a lot with the visualization aspect of this. Thank you all. That was great. Thank you, Sean. I really appreciate that. Uh, so our next speaker is Lauren Herman, who is a PhD student at Van Andel Institute. And uh, Lauren will be talking about standardizing the seat data with spike in controls. So let's uh, go ahead and take it away, Lauren. Thank you. Today, my name is Lauren Harmon, and I am a graduate student in the Trish Lab at the Van Andel Institute. And I'm really excited to share with you guys today our new bioconductor package called Spike Heat. And just to start off with a little bit of background as to why we wanted to develop this package is that it's involved with analyzing liquid biopsy data. And liquid biopsies have really gained, tra gained traction in recent years as a biomarker for cancer, as well as other diseases such as preterm birth or transplant rejection. And the way that it works is that um, in cancer, the cells are rapidly dividing, but also rapidly dying. And so as these cancers die, uh, or as these cells die, then their DNA is released into the bloodstream. And by taking a small blood sample, we're able to sequence this cell-free DNA, which is in the sample, and determine something about that particular patient's cancer. Liquid biopsies are really useful. You can use them to screen for the disease, to determine the best treatment, to monitor the treatment response, or to determine if there's a minimal residual disease or if there is a relapse. Um, also, one of the major benefits of using a liquid biopsy over a standard biopsy is that they are minimally invasive. So this is particularly exciting for us in my lab because we study leukemia. And in leukemia, when the patients need a biopsy, then they have to get a biopsy of their bone marrow, which is pretty invasive and uncomfortable for the patient, especially if they need continual monitoring and frequent biopsies. In this scenario, liquid biopsies are really helpful for these patients. And as you can imagine, it's also useful for um, other diseases such as brain cancer, in which a standard biopsy might not be the best option. Liquid biopsies can be very helpful. One of the things that we in particular look for in liquid biopsies is DNA methylation. So DNA me methylation is a chemical modification that serves as it serves to repress gene activity. So genes that are highly methylated are being repressed, so they're not actively being transcribed. This is important because it's been shown that in cancer, um, methylation is frequently dysregulated. Um, another thing that methylation is important for is that it can reveal the tissue of origin. 
So you can use the sulfur DNA to determine where in the body the tumor is located. Methylation is also useful because the different methylation profiles can reveal what cancer subtype it is or something about the prognosis or other factors. So in this example here, Bellori et al. 2017, they looked at acute myeloid leukemia and here they profiled patients based on their methylation signatures and they grouped them into different signatures and found that a lot of times these signatures correspond really well to the leukemia subtypes based on their genetic mutation. So the way that we profile methylomes is through a technique called CFMedipSeq, which stands for cell-free methylated DNA immunoprecipitation. And just to briefly summarize how the technique works is that from the sample, the CF DNA is taken. Um, and then they also use a filler DNA, in this case, Lambda DNA, which the purpose of this is to reduce the input requirements for the sequencing technique. So then they go ahead and attach their um, adapters and whatnot, and then they do immunoprecipitation to isolate only the DNA fragments that are methylated. So they do this by using an antibody for the methylation, as well as MAC beads to attract only those DNA sequences that were methylated. So the advantages of this technique are that it's sensitive, it has a low input DNA requirement, it's cost efficient, and it's bisulfite free, meaning that it prevents DNA degradation, which is really important. Um, because there is a limited amount of tumor DNA. Um, but what I want you to appreciate also is that in this technique, there are also places where technical variation can be introduced into by, based on the technique, which might bias your results. For example, the amount of lambda filler DNA can influence the results. Um, also, the antibody specificity can make a difference and um, how well the MAC beads are able to attract the different DNA sequences might be different depending on the GC content of the fragment or the amount of CPGs that it has or the fragment length or qualities like that. And so because of this, there is a need to standardize CF MEDIP sequencing. And this is really the main focus of our work here. Our goal is to make it so that liquid biopsies can be robust and reproducible, which will make them more useful in the clinic. Um, but as I mentioned before, CF Medip seq is vulnerable to technical bias, and so standardization is necessary. Here I show that if you want to compare patient one and patient two with their cell-free methylated DNA, you might have biased results based on the GC percent, CPG fraction, the batch effects, etc. And so we really need to correct for these to analyze the data. The way that we're able to do this is through the use of spike in controls. And I really like this figure from Chen et al., which um, which really shows why spike in controls are important. So in this example, they show that if there's a total signal change caused by a global change, so in this example, the experimental sample has an increase in the true relative abundance as compared to the control. And if you look at the raw data before normalization, just based on um, differences in the PCR amplification process, you might get the wrong ratio of how many reads there are between the experiment and the control. And a lot of techniques address this by normalizing based on the total number of reads being the same. This is obviously a problem because here it looks like the experiment and the control have the exact same amount of DNA. Whereas if you normalize based on the spike in reads, then you're able to correctly identify the biological variation of interest. The same can be said if there is a local change, for example, region N is increased, and again, the spikings are needed to capture this biological variation. And then again, if you look at total methylation signal change, again, spikings are useful for normalizing this data. So what we did with our colleagues in, at the University of Toronto, here, who I've listed here on this slide, is we developed synthetic spiking controls that can reduce the bias of CF medip seq and in order to determine if these spiking controls were helpful, we looked at five acute myeloid leukemia patients and we sent off their sample, one of each to three different labs who use slightly different protocols for CF medip sequencing. And we analyzed the results using the principal component analysis in order to determine if any of the variants was associated with these technical, technical factors. And what we found is that if you analyze just the raw data, then a principal component one accounts for 78% of the variation. 
And unfortunately, there's a significant association with the batch effect, which is definitely problematic. If you use the QSEA normalization approach, which is very popular, then there is a significant association with the filler DNA. But when we used the spike in normalization, we found that there was much less association with the variants. There was only a significant association with adapters, but only in principle component five, which only explains about 2% of the variants, which is very small. And so this really shows that using spiking controls that we can reduce the amount of technical variance in our data while still preserving the biological signal that is relevant. So we developed the package Spikey in order to analyze this data. And it's pretty simple in its functionality. It is able to process your reads in whatever format they may be in. It calculates the methylation specificity as a quality control step. And then if it's a generalized linear model based on your spiking sequences and any user specified covariates in order to adjust for these um, technical variables. And then using that generalized linear model, it predicts the picomoles of reads or of binned reads based on the user's preference. The overall process is pretty simple. You first add in your spike ins, add a known molar quantity into your sample. And then after sequencing, you use the generalized linear model to learn the effects of your different covariates, such as sequence length, GC percent, et cetera. And then you use this model to predict the molar amounts of your reads. And so to conclude, we showed that spike ins reduce the bias for CF meetup seek. And um, our package Spikey provides standardization that is really fast and easy to use, and we hope will ease the clinical deployment of this technique. And just to mention our future work briefly, we're also working on um, analyzing attack seek with spike ins. And we're also interested in implementing a sequence aware method using the KMER composition, which is able to look at the individual KMERs of the spike in sequences to determine if, sequ if certain sequences are more enriched than others. So we are very excited for those projects as well. And I'd also like to just briefly thank everyone in my lab, as well as our collaborators, and of course the patients, the parents, and the physicians who all made this work possible. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, that was great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and again, we'll have questions at the end, but feel free to post them uh, now if you want to ask them. Um, so uh, next up, uh, I'm happy to introduce Ben Johnson of the Van Andel Institute. And he's going to be showing us his work on the direct inference of higher order chromatic structure from single cell RNA-seq and single cell attack seq data. So go ahead and take it away, Ben. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Johnson. I'm a postdoc uh, at the Van Andel Institute in the Department of Epigenetics. And the work I want to present to you, as um, just mentioned, is, is this tool called CompartMap to enable inference of higher order chromatin structure from single cell RNA and single cell attack seq. And so this is available as a bioconductor package as well as a preprint on BioArchive. And so, kind of as a little bit of background, the uh, genome is uh, the nuclear genome is hierarchically, hierarchically organized where we can start at these very large chromosome territories at the 100 plus megabase scale. This is usually an entire chromosome. And as we begin to zoom in, um, we uh, can, can define these chromosome compartments, which tend to range from one to 100 megabases and are usually divided into A and B compartments where A is associated with uh, active gene expression or euchromatic space and, and B compartments are associated with uh, lower gene expression uh, and heterochromatic space. And the most dynamic um, uh, or domains are often referred to as these topologically associated domains or TADs, TAD-like domains, which tend to be at the kilobase or all the way up to the three, three megabase scale, depending on how you define it. And then we can go all the way to the base pair uh, scale to the um, to, to look at individual bases. And so looking at the kind of um, this multi-scale or multi um, uh, yeah, multi-scale view of the genome can provide very uh, 
great insight into the um, cell type specificity as well as regulatory space and how it contributes to health and disease. And so, like I said, these chromatin compartments can be associated with open A compartments and um, or closed B compartments, and they provide kind of this spatial control of gene expression. Um, as shown in, in this figure where the orange is, is demonstrating these B compartments or these lamin associated domains, low gene expression. And then the A compartment is associated with um, high gene expression. And as I mentioned earlier, the kind of these patterns of open and closed chromatin um, can often be uh, cell type specific as shown here where the colored regions are uh, open chromatin and the gray regions are closed chromatin where it's showing uh, different types of immune cells in the patterns of this, this these chromatin states in chromosome one. And so where things get a little bit interesting was, um, uh, at, at least for me, um, was in a fragile nucleosome seminar on YouTube. And if you're into chromatin, highly recommend uh, watching these. But one particular one from Alistair Bottinger uh, said that population scale chromatin domains are this statistically emergent property and are not stable or static entities. And so he showed this uh, in a, um, a 2018, 2018 uh, science paper with Zhao Zheng, is that if you look at individual cells as shown in uh, the left here looking at chromosome 21, that um, they produce these kind of different chromatin structures in each of the individual cells, even though they all come from a um, the same, what was supposed to be an isogenic background cell line. And where what these uh, red and blue kind of um, uh, plots represent are the DNA, DNA DNA contact frequencies where red is more frequent interaction and blue is lower frequent interaction. And when they basically average these together, what you see is when you um, average over the population, you get what you would necessarily might expect from a specialized assay like a uh, high C to profile um, higher order chromatin, but looks very different at the population level versus the single cell level, showing that it's very dynamic. And he went on to show that it's dynamic both at the TAD level, but also at the compartment level. And I don't believe that's necessarily published yet. So the A and B compartment can be very different between single cells. And so the way that we measure uh, these, uh, the higher order chromatin is often through these proximity ligation techniques called high C, non proximity ligation techniques called Sprite, and also some imaging based approaches like Alistair Bottinger's group has, has done. But what about non specialized assays? Can we also get this information from? from other types of assays? And the answer is yes. Um, in 2015, John Philippe Fortin and Casper Hansen showed in a genome biology paper that they could take a specialized method like HI-C and computationally infer uh, uh, AB compartments or open and closed chromatin at the uh, population level using non-specialized assays like single cell ataxy, methylation arrays, et cetera, that are very comparable to uh, HI-C. And so again, the color here represents closed chromatin uh, and the gray represents open chromatin. And so the reason this kind of works is that there exists these long range correlations uh, between loci within the same domain. And so in the left with a high C matrix, you have closed close interactions uh, shown in this as high contact frequency uh, or this uh, dark red uh, box here in an open open interactions here that correspond to very high correlations, long range uh, correlations in DNA methylation and uh, lower correlation uh, in DNA methylation arrays, you're able to infer similar open and closed chromatin using this non-specialized assay. And where CompartMap uh, steps in is that we are able to then take this from the population level um, all the way down to single cells, specifically using single cell RNA and single cell attack seq. And so what we're showing here is uh, as a proof of concept, we use the ENCODE tier one cell line K562. Why did we pick K562? It's because it's been sequenced to death by every possible sequencing platform. And specifically it's been um, uh, profiled using high resolution high C as well as single cell high C. And so what you're seeing here is chromosome 14 at the 100 KB uh, resolution scale, which is a, a TAD-like um, scale. And on the very top, you have a DNA-DNA uh, contact frequency derived from high C. And you can begin to observe these kind of triangular or off-diagonal structures that define um, 
these uh, these higher order chromatin uh, domains. And so where they come back down kind of to the x-axis can, can often define the edges and are associated with these CTCF chromatin remodeling machinery. And so when we look at bulk high C, uh, at the very top level, uh, purple represents open chromatin and gray represents closed chromatin. You can kind of see as uh, at the edges of these open chromatin domains, both in individual sections or kind of as a larger block as shown by these gray highlighted regions. Um, you can see they roughly, they, they correspond to kind of the edges of those, those contact frequencies. And this is also true in aggregate for single cell high C. Uh, this kind of bluish color. And as we move down to the compartment map inferred regions using single cell RNA-seq, using only 70 cells, we're able to reconstruct the higher order chromatin um, similar to bulk high C and uh, single cell high C. And this holds true for both at five cells and even all the way down to single cells. But where things begin to deviate are shown in these red regions where they um, are discordant relative to the proximity ligation assays and draw your attention all the way to the left. These uh, kind of, uh, the compart map inference, this leftmost red bar, there's open chromatin regions called in the, um, that are called as open in the closed domains in the proximity ligation assays. And so to explore if that was an artifact of the inference, we overlaid ENCODE DNA signal as well as lamin AC and lamin B TSA seq. And what we find is that there is actually both DNA signal in the absence of lamin A, uh, C or B signal in the, um, or lamin B signal and there is uh, um, some signal in the TSA seq for the lamin AC suggesting that these inferred um, open chromatin regions are in fact real. Um, but like I said before, perhaps it's because we're looking at individual cells and not necessarily a population average. Additionally, one another way to look at higher order chromatin is using uh, taking those DNA DNA contact matrices and, and converting them to a correlation matrix. And so these correlation matrices, where they're darker red, show a higher uh, interaction. Uh, these these higher interaction frequencies between the uh, chromatin domains. And so in panel B, what you see on the left upper triangle is a single cell RNA seq in 70 cells, and the lower triangle bulk high C is two to five million. Uh, uh, cells in bulk from high C. And what we observe is, is using compartment map, we can reconstruct this, these plaid-like patterns um, in uh, using a non-specialized uh, assay. And so uh, one thing we're very excited about is that by pushing this all the way down to single cells and single cell RNA, single cell attack, this perhaps opens new doors for uh, profiling higher order chromatin in single cells. Um, in samples that would never be able to be profiled using uh, proximity ligation techniques like HI-C. One other interesting component I'd like to point out is in D, where if we compare single cell RNA-seq and single cell attack-seq, what we find is that both single cell RNA and single cell attack-seq largely recover similar uh, chromatin domains, but intriguingly, single cell RNA actually has a higher information density of the higher order chromatin domains than even single cell attack seq. And so what could be interesting for future work that we're working on is um, using this inferred higher order chromatin as a physical lens to begin to integrate um, multimodal um, single cell profiling, such as single cell RNA and single cell attack seq. And so the actual workflow itself um, is as follows, where we summarize individual single cell signals uh, into, um, into compartment, or we take single cell signals into compartment map, we uh, term frequency inverse document frequency transform them and summarize them into large uh, genomic bins, for instance, 100 KB, like I was showing before. And then we employ, due to the noisy, uh, sparse nature of single cell uh, assays, we employ an empirical based shrinkage approach using a James Stein estimator where we can shrink towards a global or a targeted mean. So for instance, if you would like a targeted shrinkage, uh, if you're comparing a tumor in a normal or, or different treatments, this is possible with this method. Then we compute pairwise correlations to the global or targeted mean, produce a correlation matrix, and perform singular value decomposition, retaining the right singular vector, which represents the um, higher order chromatin domains. And so from there, I would like to say thank you to everyone involved, um, both uh, Wei Shen Lab and uh, Tim Trish Lab, who um, I am co-advised by both 
both advisors, uh, and it's been amazing working for both of them and our external collaborators, Casper uh, Hansen and John Philippe Fortin. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate the, uh, the information. It's a lot there. Um, all right, our final speaker is Joseph Lee. Um, Joseph, I don't know if you can hear me. You uh, you joined uh, mid-session, but um, if you're having issues, you may want to um, close the air meet tab and relaunch it just to uh, reconnect. Um, but uh, we're gonna we have his video, and so we'll be playing his talk. Uh, Joseph is from the National University of Singapore, and he'll be showing us um, estimating promoter activity from RNA seq data. So let's go ahead and play that video. Hi everyone, I'm Joseph, a research intern at the Genome Institute of Singapore. Today, I'll be presenting our work on Proactive, an R package designed to estimate promoter activity from RNA-seq data. To motivate Proactive, we first look at promoters, which are key regulatory units in gene expression. The promoter is the region upstream of the transcription start site, highlighted here in pink. Promoters integrate signals from enhancers, activators, transcription factors, and other epigenetic modifications. The possible combinations of these signals contribute to transcriptional diversity and isoform expression. Most genes have multiple promoters, and more than 80% of protein coding genes use alternative promoters. Alternative promoter usage have been implicated in diseases and cancers, and thus, the choice of promoter has possible clinical implications. Proactive addresses two main challenges, namely, where are active promoters in the genome and how active are these promoters? To do this, Proactive uses data from both genomic annotations and RNA-seq data. Genomic annotations are first used to identify promoters following which RNA-seq data is then used to estimate the activity at each annotated promoter. To illustrate how proactive works, here is a gene with five isoforms. We first note that promoter regions of some of the isoforms are very close to each other. We also know that a single promoter can regulate multiple transcription start sites. Hence, we group isoforms that share similar promoter regions and also those with heard overlapping first exons. For example here, we annotate three promoters. We can then estimate promoter activity as the total transcription initiated from each group of isoforms. We also consider only reads that allow us to uniquely distinguish each isoform from another and use that as a measure of transcription. This is a summary of the proactive workflow, which combines RNA-seq data and genomic annotations to give levels of activity at each annotated promoter. Here, we demonstrate the proactive workflow with two datasets. The first comprise cancer and normal RNA-seq samples from TCGA, looking at two types of lung cancer in particular, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. The second dataset comprises single-cell profiling of human embryos by Yen et al., which includes sCRNA-seq data of embryos at different developmental stages. The proactive workflow is simple and consists of two main steps. The first step in running proactive is to create promoter annotations, and the user can here supply either a GTF or a transcript database. Once the promoters are identified, the second step involves quantifying the activity of each annotated promoter. Here, data can be supplied in the form of aligned reads, such as BAM files or junction files. The proactive dataset is a summarized experiment object containing promoter counts and activities for each sample. Proactive also provides several visualizations, which we will show in the following slides. Here, we have proactive output on lung adenocarcinoma samples from both normal and tumor samples. The plot on the left shows a PCA of normal and tumor samples based on their promoter activity profiles. You can see that the normal and tumor samples are separated based on the first principal component, suggesting they have distinct promoter activity profiles. 
This is confirmed by a heat map of promoter activity, which shows distinct sets of promoters being upregulated in normal versus tumor. To systematically identify alternative promoters between two conditions, for instance, cancer and normal, proactive implements a function get alternative promoters, which takes in the proactive summarize experiment and uses a linear model to identify alternative promoter usage. In particular, we want to identify changes in promoter activity that are independent of changes in gene expression. Here we have example of two such genes, TAFA5 on the left and TP73 on the right, which are two known oncogenes that exhibit alternative promoter usage. For each gene, we visualize the box plots of promoter activity and gene expression. Focusing on TAFA5 on the left, we see that while the gene expression levels are similar, the second promoter is upregulated in tumor samples and the first is downregulated in tumor samples. The converse is true for normal samples, suggesting a switch in promoter between conditions. This also suggests that TAFA5 promoter activity can be used as a marker for normal and tumor samples, something that cannot be uncovered with gene expression analysis alone. Proactive also allows the merging of multiple proactive runs without reanalysis. For example, we may have one proactive run with lung adenocarcinoma samples and one proactive run with lung squamous cell carcinoma samples. And say we are interested in comparing lung cancer subtypes. We can simply integrate these runs with the integrate proactive function, which renormalizes promoter counts and activity. Here we process the lung squamous cell carcinoma sample and integrated both adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma samples together. The plot on the right shows the PCA of the integrated data set, and as expected, the lung normal samples cluster together. On the other hand, the two different lung cancer types in purple and green seem to have distinct promoter activity profiles. Indeed, FAM134b, which happens to be a oesophageal squamous cell carcinoma marker, exhibits alternative promoter usage between the two lung cancer types, as shown in the box plot below. We next demonstrate proactive on single-cell sequencing of human embryos at different developmental stages, from oocytes to blastocysts. A common issue with single-cell RNA-seq is sparsity, and the plot on the right shows the number of detected genes by developmental stage. We note that the number of detected genes decreases with developmental stage, possibly due to the degradation of maternal transcripts with embryonic development. For promoter analysis, we filter genes and cells to tackle the issue of sparsity, keeping only genes that are expressed in half of each cells at the mental stage. PCA based on the promoter activity of embryos shows three main clusters. The cluster on the bottom left comprises embryos from earlier stages, while the eight cells are morally clustered together, and the blastocysts form an isolated cluster. The separation in the promoter activity profiles between the 4-cell and 8-cell cluster may reflect the maternal to zygotic transition, which occurs between those two stages. Additionally, the separation in promoter activity profiles between the morally and blastocysts may reflect the process of blastulation, characterized by the establishment of cell polarity and axis formation. This shows that changes in embryonic development could be characterized by a change in promoter activity and usage. Here are two examples of genes that exhibit alternative promoter usage between the 4-cell and 8-cell stages, which may reflect changes in due to the MZT. In particular, we focus on PS1 on the left, which shows upregulation of the first promoter in the 4-cell stage, while the second promoter in the 4-cell stage is virtually inactive. In the 8-cell stage, however, the second promoter seems to be activated, and both promoters contribute equally to gene expression. Again, the gene expression levels between the 4-cell and 8-cell stages are relatively similar. The HP1BP3 on the right also shows promoter switching between the 4-cell and 8-cell stages. Proactive has also been used on larger data sets. For instance, Dennis et al. used Proactive for a pan-cancer transcriptome analysis of promoters and found tissue and cancer-specific promoters. 
Proactive has also been used in conjunction with long read RNA seq to identify unique promoter profiles for subtypes of gastric cancer. Lastly, pro proactive has also been used to identify alternative promoters in leukemia. In summary, proactive characterizes the promoter landscape in silico by identifying active and alternative promoters between multiple conditions. In addition, proactive comes with a simple, well documented interface. You can find documentation and vignettes at our package webpage here. Acknowledgements goes to Dennis and Jonathan for their guidance on this work. For Dennis who wrote the proactive package. I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this event and letting us present our research here. Thank you. All right, that was great. Um, thanks for the video, Joseph. Appreciate it. it. Looks like you managed to uh, uh, to get your technical issues worked out. That's great. All right, so we have a couple of questions. I'm just gonna ask them in the order that they showed up. Um, so first question is from Bianca for Lauren. Lauren, do you adjust for cell type composition? Um, hi, Bianca. Thanks for the question. So we currently don't adjust for cell type composition. We only adjust for um, things that you would, information that you would get from the spike, in, from the spike. So if you use Lambda, then um, it doesn't necessarily have different cell types. But that is something that could be done downstream. And maybe we can think about implementing that in the future. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up, we got a question for Ben. Ben, what's your best resolution with CompartMap, or does it depend on the SCRNA seq or SC attack seq data? Uh, so, this definitely depends upon uh, a little bit of the uh, single cell RNA seq or single cell attack seq data. So, single cell attack seq is far more sparse, and so oftentimes we are relegated to having to meta cell uh, similar cells together to um, have a high enough. Kind of signal. Um, in terms of single cell RNA seq, the um, plots shown are using a, a plate based protocol, so like a smart seq type based protocol. This is the uh, this provides the best resolution. 10x is also usable. Again, uh, we, we sometimes have to combine cells a little bit given the sparsity of, of some of those, but um, in the resolution itself, usually 100 kb all the way down to 50 kb is possible. Okay, uh, another question for you, Ben. Um, what's the rationale for cell numbers used in the single cell RNA seq or attack seq analysis? And were these cells isolated or analyzed as highly purified populations? Uh, yes, yeah, so all of these were done using uh, K562, uh, kind of this isogenic uh, cell line. And the um, again, this was a plate based approach. So the, the sorting strategy itself was just a live single cell. So there wasn't any gating associated with trying to purify even further. And the 70 cells that I had shown was a total of approximately 90 because um, the other six were controls. Um, the 20 or so cells didn't pass QC, such as like number of genes expressed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how, and how does that compare to the, how does that cost compare to the bulk use in IC data? It looks pretty good. Um, in aggregate, 70 cells achieves something like 80% uh, correlation to uh, bulk high C. But we think some of those discrepancies are a result of um, not all K562 cell lines are created equal in terms of passaging and, and things like that, but also um, we're using RNA in this case as a readout versus DNA DNA interactions. All right. Uh, next question is we have for Sean. Uh, you showed some very nice images of the regions with active and inactive regions. Uh, is the data usually this clear? Uh, depends on what you mean usually. Um, so when I take, uh, you know, well-known imprinted genes from literature, then the data tends to be pretty clean um, for the majority of them. Um, if I just look at random places in a genome, obviously it's mostly noise. So, yeah. Okay. Um, one another question for you. Uh, do you think the proactive could be used to infer relative isoform abundance? Or I think that might be for Joseph. Yeah, it's probably for me. 
Yeah, Joseph. All right. So yeah, so Joseph, sorry for you. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and thanks for the question, Amelia. I think in identifying promoters, uh, proactive bunches together, nice forms that share a similar promoter region. So, um, proactive would be used in particular to get those promoter levels or those uh, nice forms. But I think it would, if you compare the uh, proactive estimates with several group of ice forms that share the, the same promoter regions, you should see some correlation. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have another question here for Ben. Uh, can you detect changes between clusters and cell types? Is there a test for statistical significance of difference? So we do not have a test for statistical significance between um, uh, clusters yet. So this is this is something we're interested in. Um, so the James Stein estimator allows kind of this targeted shrinkage. So we're actively working on some sort of kind of iterative um, clustering targeted shrinkage, rinse and repeat sort of thing to essentially try and draw out some of that, that cell type specific um, chromatin architecture. And so uh, that's for future work, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Always fun stuff to look forward to. <laughs> All right, well, great. Um, we're a couple of minutes over, but I think this will, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and we'll see you guys in the networking sessions. <laughs>